Well, I've had a very interesting week. Uh, I thought I was going to die on Sunday last week. Uh, on Monday, as I woke up, I said to Paula, well, this is it. Um, I'm going to be with Jesus now. And I guess a few of my friends that I know that have passed away over the years have probably went, no, 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 not him, not yet, not yet. So here I am. And uh, my, my, the word I was going to speak last week, I'm going to now speak this week. So uh, today's message, it's going to be encouraging. It's going to have its elements of encouragement to it, but it's also going to be challenging as well. So I just want to encourage us just to put on that spirit of teachability this morning and really zone in on what God's trying to say to us and what He wants us to learn and what He wants us to grow in and step into today. Because actually, as I was praying, as I was putting this message together, um, one of the things that I believe God said to me was this specific series is specific for our church. And this message is exactly what our church, He wants our church to hear. So uh, I'm a pretty lackadaisy, relaxed kind of a guy, but when it comes to speaking the Word of God, that's something I take extremely seriously. And, and when I felt God say that to me, I was like, righto, okay, God, here we go. This is going to be a big one. So uh, this is the last week in the First John series. So we took a bit of a break last week because I was in the midst of dying. Um, but uh, we've had four weeks so far. And the first week we had Pastor Aaron begin the series and he spoke on the need to stay and participate in fellowship together. That seems like an eternity ago now, but it was only five weeks ago. Uh, week two, Pastor Jeremy spoke on the need to stay in light. Week three, Kathy preached on the need to stay in love, agape love, God's love. And then two weeks ago, Pastor Aaron spoke on the need to stay in truth. So... This week, the last week of the series, I'm going to be preaching on the need to stay in life, which I think is quite ironic after just listening and, and watching that op shop video and the way that they've been able to listen to God and bring life to our community here in Tatura and beyond as well. So one of the things that, uh, past tense now, that Job and I actually love to do is after school, we would go outside and we'd spend a good half hour to an hour, depending on how dad was feeling that day. Um, and we'd play sport. We'd go up, we might play some basketball or we might play some soccer or we might play some footy, totem tennis, whatever we had out there. Sometimes we'll just see what was out there and we'd make use with what we had. But uh, about just over 12 months ago, uh, we went out there and thank you to whoever put the tissues there. I appreciate that. Um, and about 12 months ago, we went outside and we went to play a game of one-on-one -on -one soccer. And so I set up my goals for Job. They're about this big. Job set up his goals for me. They're about this big. So uh, I had a bit of a disadvantage, but that was okay. But in the midst of this game, uh, we didn't realize we had this massive pothole in our backyard. And so Job had the ball and I stepped to try to tackle him. And I, actually, I heard a big crack in my knee. And then I sort of turned and I heard another crack of my knee. And so I went down like a sack of spuds and uh, Job, uh, bless him, came over to see if I was okay. Not before he kicked a goal against me first, but he still came to see that I was okay. So um, that's, that's more than I did for my dad when something similar happened when I was a kid and I went and kicked the goal and celebrated and danced around him. But um, so, you know, we're getting better as the generations go on, us Huggins. Um, but uh, I said, look, I, I think I'm okay. I got up and I was like, I'm, I'm a bit ginger, but I'm feeling all right. I think it's just a minor thing and I'll, I'll push on. Well, that was the first mistake I made. Um, fast forward, I went to the doctors and I got a ultrasound done. And it turned out that I'd strained uh, my tendon in my knee. So that didn't work for me because uh, I was about to embark on a, um, it was like a, through the month of September last year, there was a big walk for kids with cancer and I already had people that were donating so they lived up to their end of the bargain so I wanted to do mine. So I went on that walk anyway. Doctor said, don't move your leg, don't, don't do too much strenuous exercise. If you do have to walk around for the next six weeks, use crutches. And uh, I didn't really listen. I think I used crutches for about 25 minutes or something and I was done with them. And uh, so I went on that walk for 30 days, five kilometers a day 
And at the end of each one, I'll say to Paula, oh, gee, that hurts a little bit. And she'd be like, you shouldn't be doing it. But I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And then the next day, I'll do it anyway. Anyway, I did my 150 kilometers, which I said I was going to do. So I felt good about that. But I was in a lot of pain. Ended up back at the doctor's, got an x-ray done. Um, and now it turns out that my tendon is actually a centimeter off the bone. So I did more damage by continuing that and, and living in my stubbornness and wanting to achieve something that I didn't really need to do. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in the end, I find that through my pain, I go through these times where my fuse is just so short and where I find myself just snapping just a little bit where I find myself getting really easily frustrated, really easily agitated, really um, easily just annoyed at things that I don't really need to be getting all that annoyed at. And uh, I, I always reflect at the end of the day and I think, man, I could have done this better. Man, I could have done that better. Um, which, which is a good thing to do. But the problem is the next day the pain comes up again and nothing really changes. Um, so, But the thing is, in those times, I'm allowing my circumstances, I'm allowing my knee to dictate the way that I talk, to dictate the way that I think, my attitude, my speech, um, my behavior. And that's not the calling of God in my life. That's just me speaking out of pure pain or pure emotion or um, circumstantially. The calling of God on my life is to stay in life. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. That's what I want to speak on is is the real need to, to not allow our circumstances to dictate, to not allow uh, the things that go on in our life to be the cause of uh, what we do in our life. So in 1 John, uh, we've, we've heard about throughout this series, uh, John's talking to the house churches in Ephesus, and they're all stumbling in their faith. They're all going, going the other way. They're, they're doing the wrong thing. And uh, in 1 John 5, uh, John's reminding these people of their source of life. He's reminding people not to live circumstantially, not to live off their feelings, not to live out of their own agendas, not to live even out of personal opinion, but to live off the testimony of God, which is Christ, which is life in Christ. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to split this message into two parts. So I'm going to get theological and then I'm going to turn into the application. So we're going to talk about what we know, what the Bible says, and then we're going to talk about how we go. And that's how we apply this into our lives. So uh, the first thing that we know is, and I think that we might all be aware of this, the fact that we're all sitting here and we're all, uh, we all love the Lord. I think we all know this. Jesus gives eternal life. Right, So in 1 John 5, 11 to 13, it says, And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So can, let's have a show of hands. Who knows that they have God's Son? Who knows that they have Jesus Christ, who's well aware that they were once a captive, but they've been set free, that their chains have been broken, right? So we all have our hands up. So why is it then sometimes we can walk around in life as if we don't have this life that God has given us? Because we don't need to walk into this life. We don't need to try, strive for this life because we've been given this life. We were given this life the moment that we accepted the free gift of salvation. Because it says here that whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. But whoever has God's Son, and that's us, whoever has God's Son has life. We, we don't need to walk around... Uh, wallowing and, and, and living in defeat when we've been given the greatest victory in the history of all mankind. But I'll give you the reason as to why. The reason as to why is because there is an enemy out there. Some of us might note his name as Lucifer or Satan, the devil. Well, he wages war with God and he wages war with, with God's people and he's already lost 
He already lost at the cross. He lost at the resurrection. And uh, the thing is, though, he has a game plan. And his game plan is that he wants to take down as many people as he possibly can before Jesus returns to collect his bride. That's his game plan. But, and, and you know what? Even more to the point, he will use people to activate his game plan. And he'll even use Christians for that reason as well. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it in abundance. You know, we sometimes walk around in acceptance of the first part of this verse, accepting defeat, accepting our struggles, allowing them to have full reign, allowing them to have full control in our lives. But, but that's not God's calling on our life. God has so much more for you. He has so much more for me. He has called us into a life and life abundantly. That means overflowing overflowing life. So how does the devil steal and kill and destroy? Well, he does it through disturbances, distractions, and disruptions. He, he steals our attention, he kills our joy, and he destroys our hope. That's his aim, and, and sometimes we do fall into this trap. Now, I don't want to be preaching too much on the devil up here today, that's not my aim, but it, it is important to know his plan of attack because that way we can be armored and we can be ready and we can be prepared for uh, when he does try to slip in through the cracks. And we are in a spiritual war against the, uh, the, the dark forces um, and the dark realms. So uh, it is important to know uh, that, that while this might be the enemy's plans, we have one that's far greater. His name is Jesus, and he's defeated the enemy. He defeated him at the cross. He defeated him at the resurrection, and he defeats him every day in your life. You know, anytime the, the, the enemy does try to slip into the crack, this is my encouragement because it's in the Word of God. It says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he's going to tuck tail and he's going to skedaddle. That's the, the Sean translation. You know, our, our life is found in the victory that we hold in Jesus Christ and the eternal life that he has given us. Well, the second point, so Jesus gives eternal life. The second point is Jesus is eternal life. It says in uh, verse 20, 1 John 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come, and He has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and He is eternal life. Jesus Himself is eternal life, and eternal life lives in us. We walk with eternal life every single day. And we partake in this life by participating in fellowship with Him every day. The first week of this series, we spoke about the need to participate in fellowship. And that's not just with one another, but that's also with Jesus Himself. John 14, 6, I love how it reads it in the Amplified Version. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You cannot have life, true life, real life without Jesus. Nobody comes to the Father without Him. You know, that's, that's eternally speaking, that's heavenly speaking, but that's also in the, in the now as well. That's also in the current physical too. In this moment, you can't live the life that you're called to by God, the abundant life, the overflowing, joyous life in God that you're called to if you're rejecting Him, if you're being disobedient to Him, if we're not submitting to the plans and purposes that He has for us. 
Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's a real, for me, that was a real challenge. Because then I start to reflect, oh man, all the times that I haven't, I'm sorry, Lord. But that's something that we need to do. If we love Jesus, we need to keep His commandments. And you know what? Someone asked him, one of the teachers of the law asked him, Jesus, what are, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said in Mark 12, 30 to 31, He did him one better. He didn't just have one. He had two. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Wow. You know, when when you hear this, you hear the source of life speaking words of life that gives life. So that's what we know. We know that Jesus gives eternal life and we know that Jesus is eternal life. And now it's about how do we then apply that into our lives? How do we go? How do we go about that? Well, there's three really important elements. And I think it's really important to also know that we, these elements, these tools that we have at our disposal, we have a choice to make and we can use them to bring life. But the thing is, we could also use them to bring death. And that's a daily choice that we make. And the first one is life in the tongue. So our speech, our words are so integral. And this is part of, and this is going to be applicable to all these points. This is part of not just bringing life to ourselves, because life isn't about ourselves. We've got to put off all selfishness and think about those around us as well. But life in the tongue can also bring life to everybody else. It can bring life to our church. It can bring life to our friends. It can bring life to our our family. It can bring life to our work colleagues. It can even bring life to those that we might classify as our enemies. James 3.10 says, Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Out of the same mouth. We are here on Sundays and we praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the same mouth that praise the Lord, hallelujah, is then making up rumors or slandering or making up gossip um, on a Monday. But James says here, this should not be. And as people of God, as people who love the Lord, this should never be. So there is a lot of scripture, by the way, about a life-giving tongue. If I was to read out every single one, we'll be here till the freedom night at the end of the month. On that, if you've never been to one of these Freedom Nights, please make sure you get down to them. They are just spirit-led and, and just it's an overwhelming uh, place of, of God's presence. And you want to be a part of that. Anyway, there's your cheap plug, Aaron. Um, so uh, I will read out three, though. There's three verses that I want to read out. The first one is Colossians 4.6. It says, Let your conversation be always... Always means 100% of the time. Be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any, that means 0% of the time, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We've got to remember that when we're, when we're in a conversation, we're actually talking to someone. We're talking to another person just like you and me. We're not talking to a piece of meat. We're not talking to someone that we can just, you know, unleash on and, and, and that's the end of that. We're actually talking to people. We're talking to people that have a heart. We're talking to people that have feelings. We're talking to, to other people that are just like us. And then in Proverbs 17.9, It says, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Separates basically means disunity. And in Proverbs, it actually lists all the things that God hates. A lying tongue, murder. And you know, right up there with those things is disunity. 
And so I don't want to do the things that God hates. I love God. I want to do the things that God loves. Doesn't mean I don't fall short because I do. But we should always have the posture of striving to do the things that God loves. Love what God loves, hate what God hates. So that was a fair bit of scripture that I just thrown at you. I hope you're able to catch it. Got your baseball mitts out and just clunked them all in one go. Um, but they, they, all, they all have the same message. It's all about a life-giving tongue, using the tongue to, to bless others, using the tongue to speak life into our family. We are a family, by the way. We are a family in Christ. We are all children of God. And, uh, and, and these scriptures speak the importance of being able to speak love, speak grace, speak life into one another's lives. So uh, the, the, the difficulty is that our tongue has the ability to do both. It has the ability to speak life, but it also has the ability to speak death and to really break people apart. Uh, those who, who use the tongue, they use them to foster love, to speak wholesome words, to encourage, to build others up, to speak words of grace. This person is actually performing an act of worship. This person's actually worshiping God. And we know this because they're honoring God. And if we are honoring God with reverence, then we're worshiping Him. But those who use their tongue to cause damage, to hurt others, to create division, to spread rumors and gossip, this person's not honoring God. Why? Because they're dis- oh, sorry, this person's not worshiping God. Why? Because they're dishonoring Him. And so. When we dishonor God, we're allowing ourselves to fall into the trap of the enemy. And we end up doing his work. Not intentionally, but we do it. But there is a reason that we can fall into the second one. And usually it comes because we're in a place of hurt. We're in a place of grievance. We're in a place of frustration. And, um, and we're allowing our emotions to control our mouths. And... Uh, I just want to speak two encouragements from uh, experience. The first thing is, when you're going through a place of emotional turmoil, uh, we can close our mouth. That's the first one. That's the easy one to say. It's the harder one to do. The second one is uh, probably probably more advanced than the first one, um, and that is to seek God in that very moment. Sometimes we just we just we uh, we see red. And we don't think about anything else. We don't look to the left or the right. We don't look anywhere except for uh, the emotion and the frustration that we're going through at that time. Well, in that moment, just think what would honor God right now in this very moment? Is what I'm about to say, is that from, from a place of love for God or is that from my own self-seeking attitude? Um, is this something that God would want me to say or is it just something that I want to say just so I can vent, get it off my chest no matter what I leave in my wake. But I have, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one, and they lead into each other. The first one is, how much do you care about God? And I, by the way, I'm preaching to myself here right now as well. So if, if anyone wants to fall asleep, I'll just talk to myself. That's cool. Um, how much do you love God? And you might say, oh, I love Him so much. That's why I'm here today. I love Him with all my soul, all my heart, all my mind, all my strength. And that's great. That then brings me to my second question. If you love God that much, how much do you then love people? Because God adores people. God loves people. God died for people. He defeated death for people, for you and me. So if we love God, we should then love people, right? Therefore, if we love God... And we love people, how much do we care about what comes out of our mouth? Because if we love God and we love people, then we will care about the things that we say and what they cause for other people. James 1, 19 to 20 says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Quick to listen. We've got to use our ears. You know the best form of communication is right here. I'm looking like Dumbo right now, but that's all right. That's the, that's the best form of communication with our ears. And then it says slow to speak. 
Slow to speak means that contemplating. Before you say something, think about what you're about to say, what it might cause, the ripple effects of what might. Once something's come out of your mouth, just like toothpaste, you can't put it back in. We did that in kids' church a few months ago. So, Fresh on the mind. They all were like, I can do it. And they all came up, oh, I can't do it. And they all ended up with toothpaste everywhere. Sorry, parents. Um, the second one, so that was life in the tongue. The second one is life in connection. That is our relationships that we have with one another. So we are people that were created for relationship. We were created to be in relationship with one another. From the very beginning, Genesis 2.18, the Lord God also said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make for him a suitable helper. From the very beginning, God's desire has been for us to be in connection. For us to be in relationship with one another. Jesus didn't send them out one by one. He sent his disciples out two by two. So connection comes in many forms. Friendships, mentorships, family ships, (laughs) leaders, ships. A combination of different ships. But connections with people can be a pendulum. So if they're done really well, if they're really healthy, um, they can be, you know, encouraging and uplifting and and we can really help people work, walk the journey. Um, But if they aren't done well, that's when the pendulum swings. That's when they become damaging and that's when there is long-lasting pain in people's lives. As people of of the Lord, we don't want to be causing things like that. So through healthy connections, uh, we give and we receive. We can be brought into life when we hit rock bottom, when we're on struggle street, when we're really uh, hit with something that's affecting us, then other people can help us out. And when we see other people that are in this position, we can help them out when they're going through something. That's the two-way street. That's a healthy relationship. That's a healthy family. And I said it before, and that's what we are. We are a family. So let's be the people that God has called us to be and let's have the relationships with one another that God has called us to have. Let's live in that connection. You know, we are a diverse bunch. We come from a whole different range of different histories and different backgrounds and uh, all sorts of of different things, cultures, dynamics, circumstances. But uh, our common ground uh, is all that really matters. Again, thank you to whoever put that there. In my pocket, actually. I almost gave it to Paula then. That would have been yuck. Um, Last year, uh, Kathy preached on on this message. And do do we remember the Big Seven series that we had last year? The Seven Redemptive Names of God, I thought was was fantastic. And uh, Kathy preached on this message. And uh, it came from Exodus 17, 11 to 13. And and I thought it was really, it would be really helpful to to nail this point. So I'm going to use it if that's okay, Kathy. There was no copyright on it, was there? Don't have to pay you anything. All right. Uh, So this is when Israel was in battle with the Amalekites. And uh, it said, As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So just like Aaron and her holding up Moses' arms, helping him, standing in the gap for him to help him and to help the Israelites on to victory, so too can we do this with, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? We can do this. When we see a friend struggling, we can hold up their hands too. We can help them with their needs. We can help with whatever it's going to be to help them to overcome the struggle that they're in. You know, the Lord speaks through His Word today. I'm sure we're all aware of that. You know how sometimes you get people that are are sort of like, well, I don't really need the Old Testament anymore because I have the New Testament and we live under grace. We live in the new law. We don't live under the old anymore. Like that's, that's historical. That's like dinosaur stuff. Well... It's not entirely true. I understand the point. But the thing is, from reading the Old Testament, and I've been on a bit of a journey over the last 
uh, six months or so reading through the Old Testament. And what I love is that we learn the things that God detests and we also learn the things that God loves. And so we then know that we should love what God loves and we should hate what God hates. Well, one of the things that God loves that we see over and over again is healthy and mature connection. Why? Because it brings life. You know, sometimes we can think that we don't need connection to live the abundant life that God has called us to. I have me, I have my faith, I have the Word, and I read it every day. Great, but um, if you read the Word every day, then you'll see that it actually says that the desires of God's heart is that we are in connection with one another, not just um, sparingly, but regularly, consistently. So... uh, That's number two, life in connection. So we've had life in the tongue, life in connection. The third one is life in the attitude. Um, So the story earlier that I gave about my knee. Um, So my attitude clearly stunk at times when I was in pain and I was snappy and, um, you know, I would just hurt people, hurt people, right? Um, Well, I can blame the pain in my knee for my attitude. That would be a very easy thing to do, and there is some weight to that, I suppose. But watch this. I could also actually look in the mirror, and I would see the other problem for my attitude. And out of the pain in my knee and my own choice, my own attitude, there's only one of those things that I can control, and that's me. I can only control my own thoughts and my own attitude. So our attitude results in our behavior. So if we have a good attitude, even in trying circumstances, then we're going to be fruitful and we're going to be honoring God. But if we have a rotten attitude during these times, then everybody around us is just going to feel the forces of destruction that we lay upon them. And personally, I don't want to be doing that to my family. I don't want to be doing that to my friends. I don't want to be doing that to my church. Philippians 2, 14 to 15 says, Do everything without complaining and arguing, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. You know, the reason that we complain and the reason that uh, we we, um, can can grumble and and argue is because of our attitude. It's because of our attitude. And, And to be honest... Because of this attitude, it sent a bad witness to a world that is so desperately filled with people that are in need of Jesus. We don't want to be blending in. If we're blending into the rest of the world, then what are we going to achieve? How are people going to see Jesus if they're just seeing a reflection of themselves in Christians? You know, personally, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to stand up here and say, we need to... uh, spread love we need to spread the gospel you know we need to shine the light of jesus um be the church in the community just as the op shop is doing which is fantastic um and then go against everything that i'm saying other people need to do because of my attitude we need to check our attitude kick it to the curb if it's bad um so This doesn't mean uh, saying no to things as well, by the way, because we also do need to actually look after ourselves. And sometimes that does require a hard no. And you know what? Sometimes when you give a hard no, people aren't going to like it either. But we do need to look after ourselves as well. We do need to sometimes say no to things. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to the Father through Him. That sounds like a pretty good attitude to me. If you're doing something, do it with the attitude of, I'm not doing it for myself, I'm doing it for Jesus. Do it with the attitude of thankfulness that we have the opportunity to actually do that, to actually be able to be a support, to be a help. I know how many times that people have helped me. I know how many times people have supported me. Now, I don't keep a list, but in my mind, I just can't help it. And I remember things that people do for me. And I'm just so grateful 
And I'm just so thankful. I know that it can be really hard sometimes to get people to, um, to fill in when someone's sick in kids' church. But we always seem to find a way, don't we, Lily? We always seem to find a way. And that's God. And I'm thankful for that. When going through the crisis, when we're hit with something hard, when we're hit uh, with something disappointing, when we're hit with something crushing, and, and I really want to speak on this right now, when, when something really uh, affects us to a, a real deep level, um, it's actually, it's okay to be sad. You're not less of a Christian if you grieve over something heartbreaking. It's okay to, to be in pain. It's okay to cry. It's okay. It's all right. But the thing is, um, as people of life, if we see someone that is in that predicament, let's not judge them. Let's not point the finger, but let's put our arm over their shoulder. Let's stand by their side. Let's help them. Let's talk to them. Let's just listen to them. Maybe they don't want to talk and that's okay, but hey, they know that you're there if they ever want to. Sometimes people just want to talk about their situations and their circumstances, and that's okay too. People have different processes when it comes to um, getting through grief and, and circumstances and things like that. But what should always take precedence in our minds, what we should forever be fixated on, is Jesus Christ. The love and the life that Jesus Christ gives. We must always check it. You know, do I have the mind of Christ right now? Am I going into bat for myself? Am I going into bat for my feelings? My worries? Is my stress overtaking me? You know, where is my heart at? What's my posture? Where's my mind at? And if I can't shake my attitude, well, let's get back to point one about the tongue. And let's just not say anything because I can't affect anybody else with my attitude if I don't act on my attitude. But uh, I can see a few minds ticking over. You can affect yourself. You can still be detrimental to yourself. So because and the reason for that is because you're allowing these things to just creep in through the back door. And sometimes they come in subtly. Sometimes they come in slowly, but they still get in there and they affect you. And they hurt you and you create, you've got this burden that's been created inside of you and this, um, this heaviness. Well, if it's not from God, then I ask you, rebuke it straight away. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Speak scripture over yourself. Talk to God. Pray over yourself. You know, we often talk about praying for others. You can pray for ourselves. We can pray for ourselves too. Anything that's not from Him, have it be removed. The band can come back now. So the big three takeaways is that there is life and death in the tongue. There is life and death in connection. And there is life and death in our attitude. You know, we serve a God who has given us liberty. He's given us freedom. But if we say that we choose God... If you choose and surrender to Jesus Christ, if we do that, then surely we choose life. Because Jesus is life and we've chosen Him. So we've chosen life. You choose life, you choose Christ. You reject Christ, you reject life. But we have life. These scenarios, the tongue connections, our attitude. These are things that we deal with on a daily basis. It's not a one and done deal. It's like, yes, I spoke a good thing today. I've conquered that altogether. The rest of my life no longer matters. I did it. I've been there. But uh, each time we do, we'll uh, deal with them. We, we need to be aware what's going on. And we need to be aware of the choice that we need to make, the choice of life or the choice of death. Because where there is life, there is God. I said before that the enemy only comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, to steal our attention, to kill our joy and to destroy our hope. But this is not possible if we choose life. Jesus said that I have come that we may have life and have it in abundance 
Abundance means a lot. Abundance means a large quantity of something. The cup overflows with the abundant life that Jesus has given us. You know, when we allow our tongue to hurt, to hear, to hate, to cause pain, then we're giving the enemy a foothold. When we ignore fellowship and connection, we're giving the enemy a foothold. When we allow our attitude to be unhealthy, we're giving the enemy a foothold. But, but God, what Jesus has given is so much better. When we allow our attitude to be pure, when we connect in with the family of Christ that God has given us, when we allow uh, our tongue to, to bring healing, to bring encouragement, to uplift others, to love. When we do these things, the enemy will flee because that's what it says in the Bible. James 4, 7. He's talking about humility before God. And he says, submit yourselves unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, we've been called into eternal life by life himself. But there's sometimes something that we don't quite comprehend about eternal life. We think that eternal life starts from the moment we pass away. But that's not actually true. Eternal life starts from the moment, the very moment you accept the free gift, free gift of salvation. We're actually doing eternal life right now. And you know what? I get the privilege right now, so do these guys, of being able to look around. And we get to look in the faces, in the eyes of people that we're doing eternal life with right now. And it's really, really cool, by the way. I love you guys. And it's for me, it's an honor to be able to do eternal life with every single one of you. Our eternal life has already begun and we get to do it together and we can do it well by fostering life in the tongue in our attitude in our connections with one another I just want to finish with 1 John 5.21 it says dear children keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts an idol can be our own hearts and it can be our own desires Seeking things of the flesh take away from the life that we are given in the Spirit. We need to keep away from anything that takes the mantle of God. The mantle that God should be on in our homes. The mantle that God should be on in our lives. Keep away from anything that brings about death. Anything that doesn't honor God. Keep away from that. Keep away from anything that distracts you from the life that God has called you to. And we have the greatest victory. We have the greatest gift. But while we're on earth, we still have a job to do. And as we finish up this series, let's just remember that we need to be constantly in fellowship. We need to shine God's light. We need to love that agape love, God's love. We need to speak the truth of God, and we must choose life. Well, there's one more group of people that I want to speak to this morning, and maybe you heard something here this morning that really resonates with you. Maybe God's really pounding on your heart right now. Maybe He's knocking on the door. He's a gentleman. He's not going to barge in, but maybe He's knocking on the door right now, and, and maybe He's asking, hey, I'd really love a place in your life. I'd really love you to accept me. And I have a place for you in my kingdom. Well, can we close our eyes right now and, and bow our heads? We're a trustworthy bunch here at Generations. If that is you this morning, could you raise your hand and say, God, I want this life. I want this abundant life that you have given me. Maybe you're watching online and maybe it's you this morning. And 
you can do this too. You can raise your hand. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you right now and, and really believe that God is going to stir something and move in your heart. And if we could just pray together. Father God, I thank you for the life, the abundant life that you have called me to. Lord, I do away with the old and I welcome the new, the new that you have given me. I am sorry for my past. I repent and I come to you and I thank you that now I am home with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, the band's going to sing Breakthrough again. And uh, I believe there's breakthroughs happening, not just from this morning, but through the course of this series, there's been breakthroughs happening in our hearts and in our lives. And if there's something that you want prayer for this morning, if there's something that you want to see broken through, you want God to break through in your life, He will do it. Come and ask Him. He's right there. He wants to help you. He's moving this morning. We're in God's house, people. He wants to break through. So if that's you this morning, please come up the front, ask for prayer. There's plenty of people around that are willing to pray for you this morning. Maybe it's a physical thing. Maybe it's a mental thing. Maybe it's a spiritual thing. There's nothing that's too far gone for God. And there's no body that's too far gone for God. We love you, Father. We love you, God.